Hello and God bless you, brothers and sisters. My name is Reverend Jared Reed Smith, and I'm a minister here at the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church, where my pastor is Dr. Johnny Calvin Smith. God bless you, brothers and sisters, and thank you for joining me for our Sunday School Overview. We thank God for this opportunity, and we definitely thank God for you joining us each and every week for our Sunday School Overview. Now, we love to have you be a part of the Mount Moriah Worship Experience. Sunday morning worship starts with Sunday School. Sunday School in person is at 10 a.m. Of course, I offer this overview uh, to our lesson, but please join us in person at 10 a.m., for our Sunday school in-person class. Immediately following, uh, we have morning worship at 11 a.m. Wednesday night at 7 p.m., Finding Time with God. That is our adult Bible series. Our pastor's taking us through the book of 1 Peter. Peter, and then you can join us via a live stream on our YouTube page, or you can use the description in this video there is a Zoom link in the description of this video where you can join us via our Zoom link. But we'd love to have you be a part of that study at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. Of course, uh, we have so much going on at the Mount Moriah Church, and we're excited about what summer has to offer. So stay tuned uh, to our Facebook page where we offer all of our upcoming events, which include our summer preaching revival, as well as our summer vacation Bible school. If you'd like to be a blessing to the Mount Moriah Church, there is a link in the description of this video where you can give according to that which God has placed upon your heart. God bless you. Let's get into the word, but before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray and thank you for this opportunity to call on your name. God, you're so good. You're worthy of all our praise. Lord, please bless this word like only you can. It's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our lesson for today as we start a new series with Union Gospel Press, our lesson today is coming from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. Our lesson topic is Upside Down Kingdom, Upside Down Kingdom. Our golden text is Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 6. And I want to tell you that this lesson uh, for today it comes from uh, that Sermon on the Mount, a very familiar passage to most people. As we get into the word, you'll remember and be recall a lot of the scriptures that we're going to read. Those are the blessed are passages, which it starts off. This Sermon on the Mount starts with what we formerly call, especially if you're younger and when you went to Sunday school, the Beatitudes. So this Sermon on the Mount describes the kind of righteousness uh, Jesus expected of his followers. It must uh, exceed uh, the righteousness of the Pharisees, according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For it says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. And when he's talking about that, he's not talking about self-righteousness. He's not talking about thinking that you're above anyone. As a matter of fact, some of the Beatitudes speak against that. He's talking about a yielding, a uh, as it were, an understanding in this age of grace. I can give you a passage in just a second. Something just came to my heart. It's talking about not a self-righteousness, but it is what happens when a Christian is allowed, and I'm not, not in the context of the scripture today, but in this age of grace with the indwelling of the spirit, what we have as a fruit of the spirit, how we can live a life that's pleasing to God. So it's not a self-righteousness. Jesus is speaking of what is a uh, what is a product of one that is truly living out a life that has been led for Christ. So it's not a self-righteousness. It's not trying to do things to be better than anyone. It's not trying to work out your salvation. In other words, trying to be perfect, but it is a person that is yielded to the work of Christ, a person that is yielded to the kingdom, a person that is allowing fruits uh, produce uh, in their life that they can be of essence of effectiveness for the kingdom. And so he's saying uh, that we're not trying to be self-righteous like the Pharisees. He's talking about a life that is yielded uh, to the glory of God. 
allow me to give you a brief outline of for our consideration verses one through six, the individual heart. Verses seven through 12, relationships with others. And then verses 13 through 16, relationships with the world. Let's get into the word of God on today. Let's look at verses one and two. The text says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Verse two, and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, now what we see is the implication uh, that Jesus in these verses that Jesus threw away from the multitude and he went on to instruct his disciples uh, as it were privately. However, I just wanted to add this as a thought and this comes actually for our lesson com from our lesson commentary that if you look at the uh, latter part of or the ending, if you want to say that, the ending of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter seven for the Sermon on the Mount covers, you look in your Bible and you see all that red from chapters five through seven. If you understand that, you'll notice that this is a ongoing dialogue, an ongoing uh, dis or, or discourse, that might be a better word to use, that Jesus uh, had from chapter five, chapter five, verse three, all the way to chapter seven, ending in chapter 27. And so this is all encompassing the Sermon on the Mount. But my point was, is that from chapter five, verse one, you would think that this was a private affair. However, by the time you get to chapter seven, verse 28, Jesus, or not Jesus says, but the word of God says, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, the people were astonished at his doctrine. So no doubt, at some point or throughout the discourse, he wasn't just privately speaking or teaching his disciples, uh, which you might think from chapter five, verse one, uh, more, most likely many people who were already uh, trying to be around him, the multitudes that we hear about uh, probably began to uh, uh, assemble. And so by the time we get to chapter seven, verse 28, the multitude had assembled. That's just a little food for thought coming from chapter five, verse one. Of course, chapter five, verse two says, and he opened his mouth and he began these sayings. So let's move on. Let's, let's move on now to chapter five, verse three. The word of God says, blessed or blessed are the pure in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse four says, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. And so I'll give you, as we go through these Beatitudes, this is the first or beginning portion of the Sermon on the Mount. I'll give you just a brief understanding of what these Beatitudes or these blessed statements are all about. But before I do that, I meant to give you a scripture reference. Galatians chapter five. I mentioned the fruit of the spirit and that's what we're talking about. This is a person that is exhibiting and although the context of chapter Matthew chapter five uh, is in the dispensation of the law, uh, what we can understand in this age of grace is what Jesus is really speaking of, uh, or what he what he speaks of with the beatitudes. It has a similitude to a person that is yielded that is producing fruit. What is a result of your life? A person is yielded. Talk about the Christian character. We can look at chapter five of Galatians, verse 22 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, 23, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. So that's just another example of a person that's yielded. And this is a production or producing from a person that's yielded. You can produce those things, which is similar to what Jesus speaks of with the Beatitudes. Thought I'd just make that correlation. But when we come to chapter five, verse three, we talk about these Beatitudes. Now the Beatitudes from the introduction to Jesus's message uh, are parallel. This is development of their thoughts uh, and it, it parallels in the thought that Jesus has for them. See the word bless literally means happy. It literally means happy. It, it's more than just a surface emotion. It is a deep sense of being blessed by God in a way 
that leads to genuine contentment. So the first characteristics that is characteristic that is mentioned of righteousness mentioned is being pure in spirit. You see that in verse three. This does not mean those who are physically poor. Or, and I should say that means poor in spirit, not pure in spirit, but poor in spirit. This is not being physically poor. It speaks of the person who recognizes that in himself there is no merit or righteousness. That is nothing to make him worthy of heaven. It is the recognition uh, that one is unable to become righteous without the help of God. And then the verse four talks about blessed are those that mourn. Uh, those who mourn are those who see their spiritual poverty and become deeply sorrowful uh, over it. This is a godly sorrow that leads to genuine repentance. And then verses five, it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So it is uh, often said, it's a, a genuine thought or that we've said over the years that meekness does not equal or is not equivalent to weakness. Meekness is unseen as a person. It, it, it's sometimes defined as a strength, uh, but it's a strength that is under control. A meek person uh, can in reality be very strong, but is one who is spiritually mature uh, to be have this strength, but have it under control is a person who uses their strength positively and wisely and not negatively and destructively. This is a meek person. Uh, such a person does, however, submit completely uh, to the will of God. The characteristics of a meek is a person uh, who has an understanding of the will of God. And then you go on to verse six, where it talks about a blessed is person that hunger, but it says after righteousness. And this is such a person from verse five, a person that hungers after righteousness would be a similar to a person from verse five who is meek. This person has an appetite for the things of God. I hunger and thirst after righteousness. I hunger and thirst for his will. It's just like when I was hungry a few hours ago, I hunger and thirst for some food. Well, a hungry and thirsty person longs or yearns for the will of God to be complete in their life. This is an insatiable. That means it is an ongoing, thriving uh, type of righteousness. It's a longing uh, for this type of righteousness. This is a person who is completely satisfied uh, through the word of God and wants more and more. This is a person that is in tune even with worship and praise uh, to our God. Then verse seven, in verse seven and verse eight, it says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in spirit for they shall see God. And of course, we understand that God is a God of mercy. And as a result, if God is a God of mercy, then we should be most grateful that he is. And in, on our part, we understand that we deserve nothing. And so as a result of his mercy, this person, this blessed person will exhibit mercy uh, as a result of that and understand that we don't deserve his, most, his mercy. Those of us who have experienced God's mercy, meaning we are, we've been cleansed from our sins, uh, we now understand that we should live a pure life. So you'll be merciful uh, to others. The blessed are the merciful, those that understand that we live on the mercy of our Father. But as a result, in understanding our mercy, we will live pure lives. And it says, um, and the commentator writes here that it's almost climatic. It was for it says, and those who, uh, for it says, for they shall see God. Now, of course, how do you see uh, God? But it, 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 but it really speaks climatically. This is a understanding that those who do that, they recognize uh, his presence on a daily basis. So some writers would think that for they shall see God means kind of a daily understanding of God's presence spiritually. 
Uh, some might, some would think that this would, for they shall see God, meaning salvation. Uh, I could take it just to be an understanding of either way, just to be honest with you. But in context, um, it might be more seen as a daily understanding of God's presence in someone's life. Uh, I think we can safely say that this is a person who who lives a pure life uh, from a salvific standpoint. In the age of grace, those that have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior are those that will understand uh, through salvation uh, what the grace and mercy that Jesus has given us. And as a result, we should live pure uh, lives. OK, verse nine and ten. Nine and ten says, bless are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Verse 10 says, bless are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, we definitely do live in a troubled world. And so as a result, it is a person who loves the Lord dearly and daily and endeavoring to keep his word uh, who can find peace even in this troubled world. So it says, those are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Being at peace with God, living in peace with others and helping others find peace are evidences of those of persons of God. And so we exhibit these traits and we're known by these traits. Jesus then spoke about those who are suffering and, and dealing with oppression. The key thought here is that the persecution comes specifically because a person stands for righteousness. Do y'all see that? Verse 10 says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. The ability to endure this persecution is an evidence of genuine faith. Those who have identified themselves with Christ will receive persecution for righteousness sake. Uh, we can even understand that maybe Jesus was even per being uh, one that was trying to get his disciples to understand what their future was going to be about, uh, for they will be persecuted for the cause of Christ. Maybe that's what he was leaning towards. Verse 11, uh, I'll do 11 and 12. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So Jesus is trying to get them to have a proper perspective on when it deals with persecution. And they, he wanted his pers their perspective to be turned. He says that blessed are ye. You ought to consider it a, a, a privilege when you are persecuted. Uh, for righteousness sake, when you when people are uh, reviling you and persecuting you, and it says not for righteousness sake, but for my sake in verse 11, you're doing this. These followers to whom Jesus is originally and contextually speaking to, were going to experience some tremendous oppression by specifically the Roman government. So Jesus says, that this great persecution would yield a great reward. For he says that rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. And he says that you will understand that you are putting yourself in the same places of those of old. For as Jesus's followers experienced persecution, they would be following in the footsteps of the Old Testament prophets. So says verse 12. And so now we move on uh, to the second kind of portion, as it were. We move out of the Beatitudes to the similitudes, if you will. We move from the Beatitudes to the similitudes. Look at verse is 13. I believe we're going to cover verses 13 through 17. Verses 13 through 17. And in these verses, there are going to be three figures, and I'm going to do them very briefly, that are used to illustrate the, the, the believer's influences on the world. And then that's going to be three of them. You're going to see Jesus speak on the salt, the light, and the city on the hill. If you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and read. I believe I'm going to go ahead and read all of these verses together. 
I think I'm going to read verses 1. I'm sorry, starting at 13, 14, 15, and 16. It says, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Then verse 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. So Jesus moves uh, to this similar to talking about what is our spiritual influence as believers. And he uses these figurative things. He uses salt, light, and the city. And so salt, of course, thinking of that is mean, it's made and not made, but it has several features. It adds flavor and it is definitely a preservative. So as believers, we have a tremendous opportunity to have impact on the world. But it says, what, what would we do if the salt has lost its, do y'all see that? Ye are the salt of the you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor. So if, if we have lost our influence or when we have allowed the world to influence us, whether than us influence the world, you know, don't give me a dish. Don't give me a dish where my salt does not en enhance the flavor of the dish. It, it's very backwards if the dish, you know, the salt is supposed to enhance my dish. I'm talking about food. And so that's what salt does. It, it adds flavor, preservatives. We have this opportunity to make a difference. We should improve life by providing spiritual flavor to the world. But it says instead of being useless, we should be like lights shining for the Lord in this dark and evil world. Jesus chose to expand on this illustration of light by explaining, explaining how light is effectively used. You should notice that Jesus did not say uh, this is what believers should be. He says that we should not be light, but we already are light. He says ye are the light, not ye should be the light in verse 14. He says ye are the light of the world. We already are. Whether we know it or not, we are the light. Not that you should be the light. I'm sorry I'm stressing that, but it's good. We are in Christ and we are very different from the world. We are light. And since believers are lights in this world, any believer who does not function as light in revealing spiritual reality and truth to others is actually uh, not what it is going, actually contrary to our spiritual nature. Such a light is become useless to everyone in this world. And a Christian that has no testimony is useless to the kingdom. And so we are challenged, therefore, to have testimonies of being light in this world. The commentator goes on to say, I took note of this, is when unsaved people can clearly see that we live with a higher and more noble standard than those in the world, then they will be drawn to us and they would want to be a part of the kingdom. God bless you, brothers and sisters. I pray that something has been said uh, that was pleasing in God's sight and edifying to his body. Join us at the Mount Moriah Church. You know, you can always catch us on our social media, Facebook and YouTube. God bless you. May God keep you from the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church family.